for a recap of what happened on last week's episode of Teen Mom Next Chapter. Just some highlights. Bariki Smith was sentenced to probation and I hope it was a wake up call for him. Okay. We're going to get into that. And then Tyler Valtiera also showed us some of the trauma therapy that he was doing, which I felt like was super duper brave of him because it was a really vulnerable session. So he actually went away to do ketamine therapy, which is something he started talking about last season, but I don't recall actually witnessing him going through uh, the, the work. So it was quite profound to watch it happen in this week's episode. Now that was the first scene. He talked about how he was going to be going away to do that. Then we turned around and got into Leah's story. And of course she is still still very pissed off at her father for his anti-LGBT remarks. So she sits down with her friend to talk about it. And she claims that she had never like uh, remembered him saying anything like that. Neither did their mom. And I feel like this might piss a uh, you know, a lot of people off, but I'm going to be honest based off my experience growing up in a very, very small, like not even 20,000, like 18,000 population, one traffic light, like white town. I don't believe her. You know, I, I, you know, even just looking back at like the things people would say when I was young, like, I think that stuff starts early, especially in small towns. Um, so if I experienced and heard a lot of racism from like children as young as like kindergartners, um, I, I have a hard time believing in Canada, right? It's supposed to be like this like place where like there's no racism, no nothing, no problems. Um, I have a hard time believing that she didn't hear anything like that growing up in the South. Sorry, I just don't believe it. Um, but I digress. So now we get into Ryan Edwards. So Ryan, he's always in and out of rehab, right? So at this point, he, as usual, has decided to not complete his full rehab stint. And I'm like, guys, you got to stop allowing this man to get out of rehab early. He's not getting out of rehab early because he wants to work on things at home. He's getting out of rehab early because he can't do drugs in rehab <laughs> and he's looking for some damn drugs. Okay, Lord. And so obviously we instantly get news of him having an OD, which, you know, was going to happen like what were people expecting? And it's kind of like ironic because I remember how in last week's episode, when his mom suggested that he go to rehab, he's like, but I'm not doing drugs. Oh, please. Meanwhile, you get out early and you OD. What did you OD from if you're not doing drugs, Ryan? Happiness? <laughs> Come on. So, um, Macy cries to us about having to tell Bentley about the latest OD and how it's like really like, you know, traumatic to him and whatnot. But again, I'm like, well, why are we bringing Ryan back around if he's constantly getting into this stuff? Of course, Bentley would have still heard about it from like the news and whatnot and school gossip because Ryan is a public figure and all of this stuff is very widely publicly reported. But I feel like he would be less, less attached he would be more detached from the situation if there's a certain level of distance kept between him and Ryan until Ryan can get better. You know, like we were just shipping Bentley off to spend time with Ryan a couple of weeks ago. Right. So they were working on rebuilding that bond. So he was super hopeful about the recovery. And then this happens. I don't know. I do feel like Macy should go back to the consequences that she had for Ryan initially, which is that he cannot be around Bentley without a drug test. It's just, it's not, it's not safe. This is too much in my opinion. Now, uh, down in Florida, Devon comes over to Brianna's house to cook the girls some ramen and help with homework while Brianna runs some errands. I imagine that that must have been like a nice relief for her to kind of have somebody around. I think at this point she moved out of the apartment that she was sharing with her mom and sister that she bought. And so she bought a second one just for herself and her kids. So it must have been really helpful and awesome to have Devon around for once to help out with the girls while she could do some other things. And um I gotta say though, I cannot stand Devon's lethargic energy. Like I just don't, it angers me. Like people who just wander around like zombies anger me. Like it's just like an irrational anger that I have. Like wake up, like what are you doing? You know, like he's there with kids. Like he's supposed to be helping them with their homework and this and that. And he's walking around like, so y'all doing your homework. Like his eyes can't even, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I can't believe that this guy, like someone decided to have kids with him. My God, like, oh, it's just, it's depressing energy. And I really don't like it. And I think like, cause we know he has like a, an alcohol issue or something like that. I wouldn't be surprised if he was, you know, 
He had had a few, he, he pre-gamed before doing homework, right? So let's get into Barr. So Barr is just someone who I feel like has a lot of potential. And I feel like him being with Ashley can even help him to like, reach that potential and do so much more because she's studying for nursing. She's got like this boutique and this salon that she's opened up and whatnot. And I don't know what is happening with my photos, you guys. Like every time I put up a photo, like StreamYard fights me to put up a different photo. I'm like, what the hell is this woman doing here on my screen? Like it's supposed to be Ashley and Barr. So anyway, like I was saying, like I feel like having Ashley as a partner could and should motivate Barr to do better with his life. But unfortunately, he is just not ready to take those steps on his own. And so he just keeps on floundering. Remember, he was sentenced to like not that much community service. And he still like waited until the last minute to do it and then submit his paper. So he was in limbo. He had to travel up to California to see what was going on with that and everything. And so now we finally get some results from him. So he calls up Ashley to let her know that they accepted his community service hours. Okay. So he's not going to be going to jail or anything like that. Or like, you, you are free by the skin of your teeth, but information comes up about his probation. His probation has just been activated. And what does his probation entail? First of all, it's a two year duration and the details of his probation, the condition is that he cannot leave California. So as of now, he's in California thinking he's going to head back down to like Nevada, Las Vegas, to be with like, you know, his daughter and his wife, but no, they're like, nope, two years, you're stuck here. And you cannot leave California for more than two days without permission. First of all, I have to say my jaw dropped. I was like, oh, that's huge. Two years. They literally just packed up their stuff and went down. So I felt bad. I was like, oh, like, but you know what? Like you guys should have waited for all the dust to settle before making a move from one state to the other. So that was both of you guys, like not really being all that, like, you know, smart about your move. Then second of all, I'm like, you know what, Bar, it's time for you to face some consequences of your actions. And like, I think that this is going to be like a really sobering moment for you to hopefully like sit down and think about your life decisions and start making better ones. Like I would like for Ashley to stay in Las Vegas with her daughter and not uproot herself for this guy. Right. Like he needs to learn the consequences. Like I don't think she should continue bending over backwards for him. Like hopefully this is kind of like, even for her, like the, the catalyst for her to be like, you know what? I deserve better than this. Like this guy is not going anywhere in life. Like I'm done, you know, I'm moving on to greener pastures. And then like, we can work out the co-parenting thing because he's just a mess to be honest with you. Isn't he like, what is the, what was he getting in trouble for this time? Because last I recall, he like fired a gun at her like graduation party. And I, I just never got over that. I thought that was absolutely ridiculous. First of all, what are you doing with a gun? at a graduation party. And then why are you firing it off? You know, like it's inexcusable. It really is. Somebody could have been like, you know, killed by that. So I, I don't, I don't feel bad for him to be honest with you. Now, uh, back in West Virginia, it's time for Ms. Leah to stand in her power and lecture her daughters again. Listen, she's a nice enough girl, but when she talks to these kids, I feel like she talks past them and it's more catered to us to be some sort of like a political campaign speech or a motivational speech of some sort. Like it just comes across as severely inauthentic and you can very often see it in the girls' faces that they, they, they're not connecting with what she's saying because it's just, it's very dis disingenuous. Like she means what she says. I do believe that she's anti, you know, homophobia and whatnot, but like just the way she speaks, it's always like, I want people to applaud me for my speeches. I want people to review, you know what I mean? To revere me and not, I want to have a real genuine, honest, organic conversation with my kids. Like it's always a speech. And I can't even imagine how tiring that must be, to be honest with you. So let's get into Tyler. Remember, at the beginning of the episode, I had mentioned that he was going to be going away to do some ketamine therapy to help him deal with his childhood trauma. And it's particularly, trigger warning here, um, CSA. So for those who don't know, um, Childhood, uh, CSA stands for Childhood Actual Abuse, okay? So it's some very serious stuff. He did open up about this a couple of seasons past where he said that he was um, molested 
by a friend of his sister's when he was a child. And that's something that he's been carrying for a very long time. He forgives the girl. He says that she was a victim as well. And, but he still kind of struggles with it and everything. And when he's talking to his therapist, he says that he had been hyper actual as a result of all that. And I, you know, not to doubt his question, his story or anything like that, but I did wonder, I'm like, when was your phase of hyper actuality? Because as far as I'm aware, he's been with Caitlin, like his entire life, right? Since he was like 14 years old. So I'm wondering when the phase of hyper actuality was, was it like, he said he was promiscuous. And I'm like, when, like, it gets scary. Cause you're like, at what age, you know? Cause I always talk about this um, on my channel. I was very sheltered. Right. So I didn't even know what X was until I was like, 17, 18 or something like that. So the idea that a child younger than 14 years old, because I imagine this would have happened before he got with Caitlin. So anywhere between the ages of when it happened, I believe it was eight, eight and 13 being promiscuous and hyperexual, like it just, it turns your blood cold and it's scary and it's very unfortunate. And um, yeah, I don't really know what much else to say about that. It's just devastating. It's truly, truly devastating and heartbreaking that this happened to him. I don't know if you guys follow this writer. It's a little off topic, but not. Um, there's this writer and she's super brilliant. Her name is Roxanne Gay. And I love the way she writes. She has a book called Hunger. And she's, I think she's called like, there's more, there's obese, there's morbidly obese. And correct me if I'm wrong, there's something called super morbidly obese. And I believe she falls into that category. She's like, I think upwards of like, Five, four or 500 or something like that. And so she talks about how she got to that phase. And it turns out that for her, it was rooted in CSA. So her story is that at school, a bunch of boys got together and you can imagine what happened. And so she didn't want to, to have the male gaze on her anymore. And so she felt like if she ate herself into like, you know, a level of undesirability, she would protect herself you know, and so that's how she got to that. And so um, it is really sad and tragic to see the way that these sorts of events can just like really like shake up somebody's life. I used to watch Biggest Loser a lot. And quite a few people on that show would talk about how they would become super duper like, you know, obese because of CSA or SA in general, you know, maybe not even just in childhood, but you know, at a certain age. And I'm like, wow, like it's really crazy and shocking and devastating how this can manifest and affect your life, like for the rest of your life. It's really, really sad. I would love to see more awareness about this uh, being spread. So I do commend Tyler for being open to talk about it on TV and to show us his ketamine journey as well on TV. So his trauma surrounding that is not the only thing that is on his mind and on his heart and weighing him down there. He talks about feeling let down and failed by the adults in his life, including his mom, which got me wondering, where is that woman? I haven't seen her around in a while. I think at least uh, two seasons now, if we count last season. Uh, he's also grappling with the guilt surrounding putting up his firstborn daughter, Curly, Carly, for adoption. And it's all very understandable. The poor guy had a lot going on in life. You know, I think that he and Caitlin are the children of people who had no business having children, right? And unfortunately, it is also common, you know, all too common, I should say. That's why I used to get so fired up in the early years of like recapping the show. Like, cause I felt there were so many people on the show who fall into that category where like you worry that their kids will end up with so much trauma, like like them and like these other people, you know, like the Ambers, uh, the Janelles and whatnot. I felt like even Leah with all the men that she was bringing in and out of these kids' lives, all the cheating she was doing, like to break up these relationships and create instability. Ryan, like there were so many people where I'm like, guys, just stop, stop, stop. What are you doing? Um, it's just really sad. Now, uh, Macy, she is talking to her friends at this point about the news of Ryan having his OD and how he was hanging out normally with Bentley and his at his game and whatnot, just like the day before it happened. And again, this is where I'm like, we need to have a little bit more, in my opinion, distance between Ryan and Bentley for now, because Ryan is not well. He needs to work on that. And it's just too close to home at this point. But listen, her kid, her rules, right? She's going to do what she wants to do. But I, I was rooting for the arrangement that she had before, like get clean or stay away because this is really traumatic, you know? Um, do you guys have any kind of situation like this? Do you have like a baby daddy who is struggling with addiction issues and is constantly in and out of jails, in and out of rehabs, 
ODing and whatnot. Like, how are you handling it with your kid? I would be really curious to hear about that. Like, um, have you changed your approach similar to Macy? Like, have you gone from like trying to like maintain boundaries, cutting them off and whatnot to trying to like push for a closer relationship? Like, where are you at in your journey with that? Um, to be honest with you, sometimes I wonder if the reason that she is pushing for this right now is to save her spot on the show. Because let's be honest, what else has Macy contributed to this season besides talking about Ryan and Ryan's issues? Don't worry, I'll wait, okay? Now, let's go back to Tyler and his ketamine therapy, okay? At this point, his therapist starts talking to him about like how he's going to inject him and he's going to take him back to his like ch inner child and whatnot. And so the journey ultimately begins. And it was all I could say is that it was very raw and Tyler was very brave to allow that to be filmed. Like, you know, he was talking to his inner child, letting his inner child know that everything's going to be OK. He's going to have a beautiful family and be a great father and just all of this wonderful stuff. Now, let's get back to Ashley. We haven't really talked much about Ashley. We hear about Barr and his problems, but not really Ashley, okay? So when we're back in California, uh, not in California, uh, she she's looking for help around her house in Nevada and with her daughter and whatnot, with Barr being stuck in California for the next two years. So she reaches out to her mom and says, hey, why don't, I know you're still just struggling with grief, right? Like you just lost your son. You need some time to yourself. Uh, the, her mom talks about how her other daughter is like kind of feeling a little bit like, I don't know, like she's not getting as much attention or this or that. Like she kind of just wants more of her or just, just more attention in general. And so Ashley's like, you know what? Listen, I'm here alone. Barr cannot even be here because now with his probation, he's in California for the next two years. So why don't you send my sister Rosie down here so that I can, you know, spend more time with her um, and she can spend time with Holly as well, her niece. And, you know, it would be helpful to me and helpful to Rosie and helpful to you as well. So you have time to shut off mom mode and be in grief mode. And I was like, you know what? really good suggestion, Ashley. And I like the way she speaks, you know, like she just sounded so like mature and just, you know what I mean? Like level headed. I really don't understand how she wound up with Barr, you know, like she just seems like, and I know she makes bad decisions and she's a hothead and this and that, but I think like at her core, she's a genuinely smart and um, responsible woman. So I, I hope that like, you know, having her sister support and everything like helps her to realize that like, she doesn't necessarily need like bar dragging her down, you know, in life. Um, and so then we get back to Macy, but we do get a hint of Jade. So we get a phone call, FaceTime call between Jade and Macy. And so Jade basically tells Macy, hey, listen, I know you're dealing a lot with a lot of stress around in this Ryan situation, like the rehabs, the jails, the ODs and whatnot. Why don't you consider getting into Alcoholics Anonymous? That way you would be able to focus on yourself, your own feelings, your mental health, emotional health, everything without having to like have Ryan stress, you know, or anything involving Ryan stressing you out, you know, for at least one day a week. And so Macy, she seems very receptive to the idea, which I thought was a great idea. It was awesome that Jade suggested that. So Macy heads on over to Ryan's house, house well, his parents' house and the one he hasn't trashed yet. And, um, she talks to Ryan's mom, Mimi Jen, and she tells her about what Jade suggested to her about Al-Anon. And guess what? Mimi Jen jumps at the idea as well. She says, you know what? I think I want to do this. And not only that, I want to ask Larry to do it as well. I think it would be great for the both of us and actually for the three of us. So I, I doubt that they would be able to film these sessions or anything like that. But I would love to see the three of them sit down to talk about these sessions. So I know and hear what all three of them are getting out of it. You know what I mean? Because I think that that could be great um, and helpful to people watching who are going through similar struggles. Anyway, you guys, that does it. A recap of last week's episode of Teen Mom Next Chapter. As usual, I'm more excited to hear what you have to say about everything. So please make sure to leave all of your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below and we'll chat. That's all for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you what? I'll see you next time.